So Liz, you published your first paper with development in 1983. Do you remember what it was on? I do indeed. And in fact, I published two papers in 1983 when the journal was still called GENE, the Journal of Experimental um, Embryology and Morphology. And it was a collaboration with Matt Kaufman, the late Matt Kaufman. And it was Matt's idea to try and derive haploid ES cells because he was working on pathogenetic em embryos. And we, we succeeded in deriving cell lines from these pathogenetic embryos, but unfortunately they all turned out to be diploid. But still, nonetheless, it was very interesting. And that led to a, a follow-up experiment where, together with uh, Sahela Rastin, we discovered that these uh, pathogenetic ES cells, which were XX, would specifically delete parts of the X chromosome. And we used that as a method to actually start to roughly map the position of the X inactivation centre. That was the second development paper in 1986. And you've published quite a few papers with development since then, and you've also been an editor at the journal for a number of years now. Why do you choose to give your time and efforts to the journal? Well, yes, I have been involved with development for a very long time. I calculated the other day that we've actually published 28 papers over the last 33 years, and so I'm very proud of that ac accomplishment. And I think because development is so highly regarded by the community, it's a, a journal run by scientists for scientists, that... Um, People just really enjoy development and it's a very rewarding experience working for a journal that's so highly regarded by the, the community. So it's just you know, knowing that you're part of that process, I think, which is uh, what we all, why we all do it. OK, and can you tell us a little bit more about your job as an editor at development? Well, normally it's very hands-on, so I get assigned papers, either because an author has requested me or it fits within my general area of expertise. All the handling ed editors have their general areas of expertise. Mine's obviously early mouse development. So I generally start by reading the paper, making sure I think it's suitable for publication. It's going to stand a good chance of getting in. Then I assign uh, two or three reviewers. And then when those reviews come back in, it's generally fairly obvious um, what the outcome's going to be. It's either going to be minor, minor revisions, or asking the authors to do a couple more experiments just to make their argument just that bit more watertight. Or um, occasionally the paper just isn't going to make the grade for publication. And you've obviously handled lots of papers in your time. Can you tell me what makes a development paper different or stand out? Well, I generally view development papers as being really good pieces of science, very thorough, uh, very clearly presented and very honestly presented. And so I think that... We also encourage people to put a lot of data into their papers. We don't, they're not hidden in the supplementary information. And so I think you can start from the beginning of a paper to the end of the paper and really catch the whole, whole message. I think they're usually very well-crafted papers. Now, these days, there are lots of journals to choose from. What are the benefits of publishing with development? Well, I think generally development offers, first of all, as I just said, a very fair review process, hopefully a very efficient and quite fast review process. I think once a paper is accepted, it comes out very quickly. There's no lag time before it appears online or in the, in the, in the journal. Um, the, there's no charge for pages or, or colour plates. And we also encourage, as I just said, to have a lot of data actually in the primary paper. There's no limit on the number of figures. And also I think that our development papers generally stand the test of time and um, you know, become very well cited with time. And as someone who's been in the field for quite a while now, what's your advice for young scientists? Well, as an old dog, I find it very difficult to learn new tricks. I would advise all the young people to try and do their best to kind of keep up with all these new challenges. Science has become so multidisciplinary now, it's, it's very difficult to, to kind of keep up with everybody. And just reading the literature, I think, is, is quite a difficult task in itself. There are so many journals, so many online resources. So I think the easiest way, what I encourage people to do is to make use of meetings like the BSCB, the BSDB, which has just happened actually here in the UK, uh, where you can go along and over the space of three days really kind of keep up and learn what's new, what's fascinating out there and you know, interact with lots of different people from different areas. And I think it's a very important thing for young people to do is to keep going to the meetings and listening and learning. Now Liz, I hear that you make a pretty mean gin and tonic. What's your secret? Well, I think it's a good combination. You've got to choose between a lemon and a lime. Now, I favour a lime, and when you choose your lime, you have to roll it very slightly before you cut it, just to make sure it releases those, those juices and the zest properly when you add it to the glass. And then I think you really need a really good measure of gin, and don't dilute it out too much with the tonic water. Okay.